Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, fourth APS 105 plenary lecture. Today I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Von Betz, my friend and colleague. Let me tell you a little bit about, about uh, him and then he'll get to this talk. He uh, has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Manitoba. He moved around a lot. He then went to the University of Illinois and got a master's degree in electromagnetic engineering there. And then he came here to get his PhD, actually under me, uh, uh, in computer, electrical and computer engineering. Together we co-founded a, a startup uh, that was called Right Track CAD. I was the president, he was the vice president of, uh, and the real guy who did all the work. Um, and uh, that company then was acquired by Altera that, uh, and is, uh, became the Altera Toronto Technology Centre, now the Intel Toronto Centre up here. Uh, he, I worked there for a while, he worked there for a long time, driving it to great heights of excellent uh, software and electrical engineering. And then we were fortunate enough to hire him back as a professor here at the University of Toronto. He, currently teaches in second year, although you won't get him in second year because he won't be teaching it next year. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Von Betz. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so I won't be teaching the second year programming course that I usually teach, 297, uh, because I'll be on sabbatical. Because that sounded a little mysterious. You kind of might go, oh, what happened? Why, why is he no longer teaching? So I, I had a pang of fear. I thought I'd pass on why. Uh, so let me can you can you hear me through that mic? Let's mute this guy. Oh, you just, okay, you're good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how I came to love software. I was a pretty uh, reluctant software engineer early in my career when I started my training, uh, and I came to have come to find feel software is probably the most valuable skill that I have. So I want to share with you some of the things I've done with software. Um, hopefully that inspires you to really throw yourself into APS 105 and kickstart your own software training. Okay, so you're in APS 105, uh, and I guess I just told you this. My goal is to convince you that programming is important, uh, not just if you want to be a software engineer. So if, you're a computer, if you decided you want to be a computer engineer, you want to focus on software, then you're probably already convinced APS 105 is really important. Uh, but it's not just important if you want to be a, a software engineer, it's important for all design engineers. Anyone who wants to create products and technology today, I think, needs to be good at software. Uh, so how am I going to uh, kind of convince you of that? I'm going to tell you stories about my own career, uh, and hopefully that, again, inspires you to start practicing programming uh, a lot right now in APS 105 while you have the chance. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a, my life in, in brief in this presentation. So I started my bachelor's degree in 1987 in electrical engineering at the University of Manitoba. So this is the uh, University of Manitoba in summer. You may have heard in winter it's somewhat colder. There would be snow. Uh, and I really liked math and physics. So I was not terribly interested in software. I wanted to design real physical products that required deep understanding of math and physics. That was my goal. Okay, so I had my first programming course. Uh, in first term, first year, it's in a language called Fortran. Fortran was uh, arguably the first kind of high-level language, a language that's above the level of machine code. Uh, it's still used quite a bit for scientific computing, but it's not as powerful as C, the language that you're learning to now. But that's what I learned, and it, I didn't enjoy it that much. It took forever to get simple things to work. So uh, the assignments I found boring. You know, add 20 numbers together, they seem kind of trivial. They still took me a long time to do, despite the fact that they seem pretty trivial. It's the lowest mark I ever got in university because I didn't apply myself as much as I should have. And I never took another programming course. So, so Professor Rose is probably going, what the heck have I done? Why did I bring this person to speak today? This is a terrible message. Uh, okay, so let me talk about what I did like before I, I go on to how I came to find software more rewarding, more valuable later. So I really liked Maxwell's equations. You don't know this yet, so how many people have ever seen Maxwell's equations? Probably a couple, right? So you haven't gotten to them, I think, yet in your curriculum, but you will. So all, and they're, in my opinion, beautiful. These four equations, which are vector calculus equations, uh, define all of electromagnetic phenomena. So all electricity, all magnetism, how you generate uh, electricity, how you use it, how you generate electromagnetic waves, so all of light propagation, etc., all defined by these four equations. So if you can solve them, you can understand um, a huge fraction of physics. So I really like that. Uh, and I got a job in my second year 
as an intern at a company that wrote electromagnetic field solvers. So I thought it was a great opportunity. I really like math and physics. I'm going into a company that has a bunch of PhDs who work on writing uh, solvers for electromagnetic equations. Uh, and what they did is they'd solve Maxwell's equations for real systems. So this, for example, is a picture from their website, because this company's still around. Uh, and this is a motor. So a motor is a, a bunch of magnets and coils of wire. And if you want to make your motor more powerful, you can simulate what's happening with the electric and magnetic fields and uh, try various magnet and placements, various coil designs, try to make your motor smaller, more powerful, more efficient. So they wrote software that let design engineers you know, do these kinds of tasks. OK, so I thought, well, this is great. I get to do lots of math. Uh, and I kind of did. I did get to do some math. Uh, but my first task was this. Uh, the company had a contract with the US Navy. Uh, and the contract was to analyze, well, to, to help the US Navy better communicate with submerged submarines. So that's the overall task. So you want to communicate with a submerged submarine, because you don't want it to come to the surface. It could be dangerous for the submarine, but you still want to be able to send it uh, instructions. So how do you do that? Uh, well, you have to use very low frequency radio waves. Uh, Seawater is partly conductive, and radio waves do not go, electromagnetic waves do not penetrate very far into conductors. Seawater is not a great conductor, so it doesn't collect, conduct electricity really well which means if you use a low enough frequency uh, radio wave, uh, it, when you study electromag electromagnetics in a couple of years, you'll find that the lower your frequency, the deeper you can penetrate into a conductor. So if you use a very low frequency radio wave, uh, you can get uh, about 20 meters penetration of your signal into seawater, which means you can communicate with a submerged submarine. So that's what the US Navy wanted to do, and they were doing this. So how do they do it? Well, if you have a 30 kilohertz uh, radio, your wavelength is very long. Okay? Wavelength is just 1 over frequency, so your wavelength uh, of the electromagnetic waves is 10 kilometers. So you need a really big antenna. One of the principles that, uh, of radiating energy is that you want to have a structure that is uh, ideally a quarter of the wavelength or more to radiate efficiently. So a quarter of the wavelength here would be you know, on the order of uh, uh, seven kilometers. So that's a really big structure. You can't actually make something quite that big, uh, but we need a really big antenna. So that's one of the reasons that your cell phone does not use 30 kilohertz uh, communications, because you don't want a cell phone that is seven kilometers on a side. Your cell phone uh, is communicating at several gigahertz, where the uh, radiation, the radio waves are you know, on the order of centimeters. So you can radiate efficiently from your cell phone case, even though it's only a, self, a few centimeters long. That's not the case here, though. We need to radiate these really long waves, so you have to build huge antennas. So these antennas, these are actually some of the real antennas that are built for this purpose. So they're uh, hundreds to thousands of meters tall, so they're approaching a kilometer tall, uh, and you build a lot of them. So here's an array of them that covers uh, more than a mile across, uh, and you put a lot of power into them because they're still actually not that efficient at radiating these huge waves. So they take megawatts of power. So the US Navy wanted to optimize these structures. How can they make uh, arrays of radio towers like this that can radiate more efficiently and not take quite so much power? OK, so how are they going to optimize this? Well, we could solve Maxwell's equations. I told you these equations define all of electromagnetics. So if we can solve these for those kinds of antennas, we can, uh, we can figure out what's going to happen for any antenna design we want. And we can use that to rapidly optimize our design, come up with the best design we could possibly have. Uh, but these are complicated equations. So we can solve them for basically simple cases. So we can solve them for a, a dot like a point of charge. So I've got a tiny point of charge. What's the electric and magnetic field everywhere? I can do that. Uh, and in a couple of years, you'll be able to do that too. We can solve it for an infinitely long straight wire carrying some electric current. We can work out what magnetic field that would produce. Uh, so basically, very simple geometries. Does that look very simple? So hopefully, it doesn't look really simple to you. It didn't look simple to me. 
So we can't solve that just by directly applying the math. Doesn't matter how long you study you know, vector calculus and mathematical physics for, you're never going to be able to solve that. Okay, so how are we going to solve this? Well, you can break up the problem into thousands of subproblems, treat it as thousands of tiny points of charge, and we know, if we go back here, we know the answer for one point of charge. Uh, so we solve all those subproblems where we can handle the math, and then we add them together to get the full answer. Okay, so how can we do this quickly? So when I say many subproblems, I mean hundreds of thousands of subproblems to describe the antenna I showed you as uh, tiny little points of charge and do it accurately, accurately. We're not talking two, three, 50 or 100 points. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of points, and that allows you to model it accurately enough that you're actually modeling the real problem. So you can't, you can't add up these, you can't solve these subproblems by hand, add up their solution. You need to write a program. Uh, so that's what we did. So this is a picture from that uh, uh, CAD company, Integrated Engineering Software, uh, just showing you know, some of the visualization that might come out of that solver. So we solve what is the, for a certain antenna design, what would be the uh, electric and magnetic field everywhere, and then you can go visualize that using some computer graphics. Uh, you can check the, we didn't do this, but now the US Navy engineers could take it uh, and they can decide whether a change is beneficial, whether they're getting a better antenna or not. Okay, and they would repeat this very uh, rapidly. So without building, you know, it's hugely expensive to build one of these arrays, so they're not gonna build a whole bunch of them and see what works best. They're going to simulate hundreds of ideas, thousands of ideas, and see which one works best, and then they're going to go build that. Uh, so this was kind of my first introduction to how math and programming really fit together. Math can only solve relatively simple geometries in physics. If you want to solve something complicated, you take your mathematical skills, you encode them inside of a program, and use it to put together uh, the solutions to big problems. Uh, so other customers for that company um, were MRI, MRI manufacturers. So I found a lot of the design applications of the software that I was helping to write were really interesting. So this is a magnetic resonance imager. Uh, who here knows how a magnetic resonance imager works? Does anybody know how it works? What do you think? Uh, yet that is basically what happens, okay? So it is using uh, electromagnetic waves to see what is inside, you know, your body. Uh, does, is there anything unusual about it or in, kind of interesting about its design? Uh, what makes these things expensive? They are expensive. The, the, they cost typically millions of dollars. So why are they so expensive? Any ideas? Okay, so don't worry, I can tell you, I know why. <laughs> so. Okay, so an MRI, what it does is it's, actually, it's measuring, let's see, basically various nuclei have a magnetic moment, which means if you create a strong enough magnetic field, the atomic nuclei will line up in a certain direction. They will line their magnetic moment, their magnetic field, up with that external magnetic field if you make it strong enough. You can then send in an electromagnetic uh, radiation, some radio waves, so it doesn't have to be that strong. It basically knocks the, it interacts with those nuclei, knocking them out of alignment with the field. And then as they spin back to realign themselves, you can measure the electromagnetic waves they give off. So it's pretty complicated how it works. Uh, but it allows you to image uh, things like the water density inside of a person's body in three dimensions, which is extremely useful. You know, you can go and find uh, all sorts of problems in the soft tissue of a person's body using this technique. Uh, and that can be hard to figure out with other techniques like x-rays. Uh, the key thing to get good images is you need a really strong magnetic field. You get a really strong magnetic field, you line up those nuclei, uh, and they're going to produce a clearer signal when you knock them out of alignment and they spin back into alignment gradually. So the way you produce a really strong magnetic field is with superconducting magnets. So you take magnets of various, that are coils of wire, uh, so they're electromagnets, uh, they're super cooled. They're cooled down to, you know, typically 20 to 70 degrees above absolute zero, depending on what kind of material you're using. 
and then you put incredibly high currents through them and produce extremely strong magnetic fields. So the magnetic fields that are produced by these magnets are more than 10,000 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. They're so strong that if you were to drop, uh, I was reading one of the journal articles on these when I was uh, working on this solver, and uh, if you were to drop just a metal pen, so a pen that had metal in it inside of an MRI's uh, magnetic field, it would be accelerated to lethal velocity in three centimeters. So you don't want to bring your pen in trying to take notes, okay? Because in three centimeters, you drop it here, it's gone that far, and it's already at a, a velocity that could kill you. So that's how strong the magnetic fields are. So should we design this by trial and error? We want to get a very strong magnetic field. We also want it very uniform. So we want the magnetic field to be as uh, constant as possible across the whole bore, the whole inside of the magnetic resonance imager so that we get clean, clear images without distortion. Should we design this by trial and error, just trying all sorts of superconducting magnetic designs and trying to measure whether the magnetic field is uh, uniform or not? It's one of those questions that hopefully anyone can answer. Probably not a good idea to uh, design this by trial and error. It's going to be extremely expensive, extremely slow. You don't want to build this by prototyping testing. So you want to simulate. So we need software again. And thankfully, we know what the physics is. The physics uh, is governed by these Maxwell's equations, so we again need to write software. Uh, and it's interesting what the software we we're writing were used for. So it was used to make the, design the magnets for these machines uh, to make a more uniform, stronger field, get better images. Another uh, problem that our software was used to solve um, was, a, was a little different. Okay, so we have an enormous magnetic field inside these MRI machines, so more than 10,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. So what happens when you walk through a magnetic field? Does anybody know? How does a generator work? So I was looking forward to things you'll study probably in another year or two, but how, does anyone know how a generator works? How do you generate electricity? Any ideas? Yeah. Right, so you said you have an electromagnet that induces current on a wire. So if you change a magnetic field, you will induce a current. And that's the principle of how you generate electricity. That's how the hydroelectric plants work, that's how the, gener the alternator in your car works, this is how basically all electricity generators, uh, well, traditional electricity generators work. So I have this extremely strong magnetic field in a hospital. When you walk through a magnetic field, you are feeling a changing magnetic field. So if there's an MRI machine over there and I start walking towards it, I'm here, there's no magnetic field. As I walk towards it, it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So if there are any loops of current, that will induce a current in them, or any loops of wire, that will induce a current in them. That's exactly how a generator works. Okay, so what is a pacemaker? Do you know what a pacemaker looks like? Uh, happily, I have a picture here. So a pacemaker, um, you know, it's been hugely beneficial to a, a very large number of medical patients. Your heart actually beats in response to electrical stimuli. So an electrical potential builds up across the muscles of your heart, and that actually makes your heart contract and pump blood. In some people, the electrical potential stops building up in kind of an orderly fashion, and their heart stops beating uh, with a regular beat. Uh, and this is very dangerous. Eventually, this could kill you. So pacemakers, basically provide that electrical potential externally. So you have a little computer chip uh, and some software running on it, you have a battery, and you have wires that actually go to your heart, and it applies a regular voltage at several locations on your heart that actually makes it beat. So that's what a pacemaker does. Uh, but the problem in a hospital is this is actually a loop of wire going straight to your heart. And you have these MRI machines that are producing incredibly strong magnetic fields. If you walk towards them, you can induce current in this loop, because that's what a changing magnetic field does, and only a few tens of microamperes, so very small current, uh, directly applied to your heart can make it fibrillate. So you've probably all seen medical uh, shows where they say the person's fibrillating, okay? And they grab the big paddles and they say clear and they shock the person. So what does fibrillation mean? Do you know what fibrillate is? Is it a made-up Hollywood word that they just made up and doesn't mean anything? So it's not. It's real. It's a real medical word. Yeah. Isn't it when your heart stops beating properly because of 
Yeah, so your heart has stopped beating, is a perfect answer. Your heart has stopped beating properly. Its electrical system signals have essentially become kind of chaotic. Instead of this regular, okay, positive voltage here, negative there, now switch, you're getting irregular electrical potentials and your heart's beating in an erratic way, and your heart has four chambers. If it starts beating in odd orders, it doesn't really pump blood very well. So this will actually kill you. Uh, what the people are, what the medical uh, personnel are doing with those defibrillators is actually applying uh, a large current, usually several amperes across your heart, which actually stops your heart completely. So they're basically rebooting your heart, right? This is like the blue screen. You're facing the blue screen of death, literally, and they reboot your heart. And it's stopping your heart completely. Usually your heart will actually start beating properly again. It's gotten into a weird state. So that's what fibrillation, uh, a defibrillator does, stops your heart, lets it beat properly again. Uh, fibrillation is the opposite. If you apply just a small amount of current directly to the car heart that's in the wrong um, you know, order, basically, it's, it's got the wrong var variation with time, you can make the heart fibrillate, you can confuse it. Uh, so this is really dangerous. So you're in a hospital, you have these incredibly strong magnetic fields from your MRI, you have people walking around with pacemakers. If they walk outside the MRI machine, uh, the room that has the MRI machine, and there are some stray magnetic fields that can induce a current uh, in the metal that forms the pacemaker uh, current loops, uh, and it can make the heart fibrillate. They will fall down and uh, you know, die right outside the MRI machine, which would be obviously very bad. Okay, so inside of a hospital, you need to shield the MRI machine very carefully. So the MRI machine is really expensive, and it goes in a room that has expensive steel shielding. To stop magnetic fields is actually a lot harder than stopping electric fields. You need to use what's called ferromagnetic shielding, which means basically iron or steel, something that tends to uh, attract magnetic fields a lot. Uh, and those magnetic plates have to be quite thick, uh, and you can't have gaps in them. And you need to get this magnetic field down a lot. You have to drop its strength by more than 10,000 times right outside the room so that it's safe for hospital patients. Uh, again, this is very expensive to do by trial and error. So you have to simulate. It's another use for this kind of advanced software. Uh, and this was something that uh, one of our customers was doing when I was working at this company. Uh, they were an MRI manufacturer. They had installed one of their MRIs in a hospital in the Netherlands. And the shielding was inadequate because every time a truck drove by on the highway, uh, the images went crazy, okay? So they knew the shielding wasn't good enough, so that's both bad for the quality of the images and uh, also dangerous uh, for patients. So they were paying huge late fees to the hospital and uh, they tried to shield the room already a couple of times and it wasn't working. So they needed to simulate this and figure out what was the problem, what should they do? And they needed to do it in a hurry so that uh, they could bring this online and stop paying these late penalties. Okay, so that's a bunch of stories about uh, this early internship I had. It was a great experience. I went back as a full-time employee for, for some time after I graduated. Uh, and I guess the key thing is I found software was fun. So it was really interesting. It wasn't that long after that first year experience uh, where I really didn't like the programming course I had. I now went in after second year and again third year and again after my uh, graduation. I worked at a company where I'm writing lots of software and I found it really fun. So what was the difference? Well, the applications were more challenging. They were mixed with math, which I really liked and found challenging. Um, so I was using software not to solve trivial problems, but as a powerful tool to solve problems that I really cared about. Uh, it also was not as painful to get things working. So this is much more complicated than adding 20 numbers together. And you know, it did take quite a lot of work to, to make the software function. But as I uh, got better, as I at first understood that that's just part of the procedure, nothing ever works the first time. So debugging is just a key part of developing software. You can't get away from it. So first accepting, I'm gonna write the software and I'm gonna spend a lot of time debugging it. That's just the way it is. Uh, made this more fun for me. Uh, I learned debugging techniques. So you get much, much better at figuring out why software doesn't work, uh, being a detective and making it work. Uh, and I learned how to use tools like a debugger, which allow you to visualize or see what's inside the software, what's happening to every variable, which makes you much more productive. So you know, those changes, working on something I cared about and becoming much better at making things work made software far more fun for me. Okay, so then I went off and did my master's degree at the University of Illinois. This is a picture of what it looks like there. 
uh, and actually worked in the same broad field, writing simulation software for you know, physics for this electromagnetic phenomena. Uh, this is a piece of uh, circuitry that you would use in a, a computer, and it's being simulated at very high speed. Uh, when I did my PhD, where I worked with Professor Rose, I switched areas. So I got very interested in how computer chips worked. So I switched and started working on computer chip design. Um, but I didn't want to design chip, computer chips by hand. You know, they're complicated. They have many, many transistors. Uh, so I wanted to write software to help. Uh, and that's called computer-aided design. So I'm certainly not the first person to, to think of doing that. Modern computer chips have so many transistors, you cannot possibly build them without advanced software. But I thought, I want to be the person that is writing the software, coming up with the new ways to, to do things automatically, not the person who is you know, trying to compete with that software, trying to work faster and harder as the software gets better and better. I'd rather be the guy writing the software. Uh, <clears throat> But again, I was using the software to do something that was interesting to me. Coming up with new hardware ideas, new computer chip ideas, writing software to test them out, uh, to automate them. Okay, so I was working on a certain kind of computer chip called a field programmable gate array. It's a type of computer chip that is interesting and that is programmable. So you can, after it's built, you can program it to essentially rewire it, change millions of switches inside of it to make it do different things. Uh, so that's an interesting kind of computer chip. It's too complicated to evaluate analytically. So you can't just write down equations and, and try to mathematically model what's going to happen inside this chip. Uh, because there are too many interacting things. You have the process technology. So the process technology is how are you going to manufacture this? And that's constantly changing. The uh, size of the wires, the size of the transistors that you can develop are constantly getting smaller as new process technology comes online and the exact characteristics of how this process technology works is constantly changing. Whoops. Um, so this is just a picture of a process technology from a few years ago, and you're just seeing uh, the metal. So the metal is basically stacks and stacks of uh, wiring, and the transistors are tiny down here. You can't even see them. They're too small. You take that process technology, you think of how are you going to build circuits out of it. So you think of how you're going to group those transistors and wires together to make more interesting elements. Uh, and you're going to um, think about how you combine those little bits of circuitry into what's called the chip architecture, which is how does this whole chip, which has billions of transistors, work. So we build some low-level circuits, but then we need to think about how we're going to group those together into uh, an overall chip that performs some useful function. And what allows us to use this, this chip and also allows us to answer questions about how well it's going to work is really advanced software. So uh, a modern field programmable gate array has hundreds of millions of programmable switches inside of it that have to be set to one or zero to make the chip do anything. Um, there's no way an engineer can basically set hundreds of millions of switches to make the chip do something. You need to describe what you want. I want the chip to do to be a, a router for the internet. I want the chip to be uh, in a wireless base station talking to my cell phone. So you have to describe in a very detailed way, what do I want this hardware to do? And then a very complicated software program figures out how to take your description and what settings of those millions of switches would allow your uh, hardware design to be implemented in that chip. So I'm working on this software. Um, but I'm using it to answer questions about how to make these chips better. Uh, so this is just a picture from that software that I wrote uh, in my PhD. Um, this is basically showing we, ha we have a few decisions to make. Where do we put every little piece of circuitry? Uh, and then how do we wire them all together by setting switches? So those are actually complicated problems uh, where there are many decisions to make. So you need fairly advanced computer software. Uh, so I worked on this through my PhD with Dr. Rose, and then we started getting a lot of industrial interest. Uh, so myself, Jonathan, and two other researchers formed a company called Right Track CAD. And this highlights another very good thing about software, which is that it's much easier to start a company than it is in most other types of engineering work. There are no large upfront costs for manufacturing. You know, your manufacturing for software is you put your software or the executable code on a website. So basically no manufacturing costs. Um, you can 
develop products quickly, you can distribute them to customers very cheaply. So we were able to start with what's called bootstrap financing. Does anybody know what bootstrap financing is? So have you ever heard of this term? Okay, so bootstrap financing means you get your customers, your early customers, to pay uh, for the development of your product. Okay, so nowadays uh, you can use bootstrap financing with many people putting in little bits of money on things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So that's a form of bootstrap financing called crowdfunding. You get a whole bunch of people, maybe a thousand or 5,000 people to pay you a little bit of money for your product, you know, your, your new fancy shoe, uh, before you've actually developed it. Uh, we did bootstrap financing, but from large companies. So we're developing software that will make a certain kind of computer chip more efficient and easier to use. And there are large companies selling that kind of computer chip. Uh, so we had two early customers, each of them paid you know, several million dollars for us to develop uh, the software that, uh, that we promised we could develop. Uh, so they provided that money, or at least some of that money, in advance, which means we could start the company uh, to develop the product. That's much easier to do with software because the amount of money you're asking for is smaller than for many other things. If you were going to develop a new airplane, you might need to ask for hundreds of millions of dollars in advance, and no one's going to give that to you. For software, you can do it for you know, sometimes thousands, tens of thousands. In this case, we needed kind of hundreds of thousands or low millions, but that's still a much lower number than you'd need it for you know, many other projects that require a lot of hardware and mechanical devices. Okay, so our startup was successful. Um, we basically made new software that could map circuits onto a chip. And this was complicated software. Uh, we had to choose, for example, one of the problems we had to solve was you've asked for the chip to do some function. And uh, the way that this CAD tool works, this computer design tool works, is it divides that complicated function you've asked for up into little pieces, about a, little mil a, li a million little pieces of circuitry that together could implement what you've asked for. We now need to decide for each of those million little pieces of circuitry, where do we put it on the chip? There are a million of these things on the chip, and you need a million functions. Where do we put each one? We want to put things that, are, uh, that need to communicate, that are going to need to be wired together, close together, but there are a huge number of choices. So the number of choices of where you can put a million things on a chip that has a million spots uh, that can accommodate those little circuit elements is much greater than the number of atoms in the universe. So you can't just say, I'm going to try them all. So you need to use um, complicated algorithms that have a lot of uh, interesting characteristics and a lot of creativity can be brought to bear to figure out how can we do this efficiently. Uh, so it was really actually very fun, interesting software to write because it wasn't just about how do we debug this software. It was like, what is our whole approach? What is the algorithm we can use for this? Uh, and that also gave us the opportunity to be very different from what other programs that were targeting this problem were doing. So uh, Altera was one of our initial customers. And we are, again, writing new software to implement designs in their chips. Uh, and they were comparing this against their existing software that they spent you know, many years developing by uh, you know, about 100 engineers. So they put a lot of effort into their software. But their software, on average, took about eight hours to run. Uh, this new software we wrote took about 15 minutes. Uh, and the circuitry that we produced ran 38% faster, which was valuable. That meant that Altera could sell its chips for about twice as much money, because the ed engineers that were using their chips would be able to run them faster because our software had done a better job of finding the things that had to communicate and putting them closer together on the chip so that you could run them faster. Uh, so to continue the story, the software really um, was the most important thing in this whole industry. So Altera, one of our initial customers, acquired RightTrack CAD Company. And the reason they acquired us, because they already had this new software for their existing chips. You know, that was, they'd, we'd written a contract, we developed better software, but they got to use it. That was the contract. That was why they provided funding in advance. You know, that bootstrap financing was that if the software worked well, they would own it. Uh, but we made the argument to them that the software that we had written really would benefit from a different chip design. 
Their chips had been designed without knowing about these new software algorithms. And if we were allowed to change the chips for a future generation, if they could be modified, they could be a better target for the software. They could work a lot better still. Uh, and that argument made sense to Altera, right? They thought, yeah, there is a lot of value to having these people who write software come in and specify how our next generation chips should work so that their software can take best advantage of it. And uh, that was really the key that led them to say, well, we should acquire this technology, uh, which led to the creation of Altera's lab here in Toronto. And, and I worked there for many years, so that was a very fun experience. So the FPGA industry today has about $5 billion in revenue every year. Uh, so they sell lots of chips. You usually don't see them in any, you'll, you, you won't see them for sale in Best Buy or on Amazon, but they're inside lots of products if you open them up. So if you uh, have a high-end router that's sending data over the internet, and you open it up, you usually find FPGAs in it. If you are ever to climb up the towers that your uh, cell phone communicates with, that uh, allows you to communicate with other people and you opened it up, you shouldn't actually do this because it's dangerous and pretty illegal, uh, but you would find a bunch of FPGAs inside there. Inside those magnetic resonance imaging machines that I talked about earlier are also FPGA chips. So they're sold into all sorts of uh, things and about $5 billion a year of these chips are sold and they're very profitable. So the profits are about $2 billion and that's very high. Usually profit margins are nowhere near this high. Um, because usually there's more competition, nobody can charge such a high price and make such high profits. So why is it so profitable? It's probably a hard question. Uh, the key reason is the software. The software is very hard to develop. So most computer chip companies are not this profitable because they have more competition. This industry, uh, it's, the software makes it so hard for new companies to get into the industry that the existing companies can charge higher prices and be more profitable. Um, so what I find interesting about that is your, your barrier to entry, your most important, most valuable intellectual property, even for a hardware company, a computer chip company, is actually the software. Okay, so another thing that's very useful about software is, uh, that I've already hinted at, is it's the way you automate. So it's the language of automation. So this is a picture of the last Altera chip that I worked on before I came to the University of Toronto. So it's called Stratix 5. It uh, uses transistors that are 28 nanometers uh, long, which means they're 28 billionths of a meter long. So this is a very advanced manufacturing process. This, this is one computer chip on a wafer. It has about 2 billion transistors on it. Uh, and the largest computer chip in this family has 4 billion transistors in it. So we have a chip that has 4 billion transistors in it, and we need to choose the size, um, basically how how wide the transistor is, which will affect how much area it takes on the chip, but also affects how much current it can drive. So this is a complicated trade-off. Bigger transistors can make your chip faster, but they also make it bigger. So you want to choose an appropriate size for every one of these four billion transistors. And there is some regularity, so there are patterns. It's not like we have four billion random transistors. Uh, there are some basic structures that get repeated, um, but there are certainly hundreds of thousands of different transistors that you need to choose their, the size of each one, even when you account for that regularity. So you, Altera actually used to do this manually. So a team of uh, people in California, uh, four or five engineers would work for a year. Uh, they would still use software. They would use simulation software, but they would run that software. They would look at the answer. They would try something different. They'd look at that answer, and they'd repeat this and keep going for a year and eventually decide on the, si decide on the size of every transistor. And uh, one of the engineers uh, here in Toronto, at Altera Toronto, um, was at his cottage one weekend, and the weather was bad, so he decided he would just write a program to size all these transistors, and he was actually able to do it. So he spent the weekend, he wrote a program that would automatically uh, try various transistor sizes, invoke the simulator, evaluate the answer itself, decide what to do next. Uh, and after that weekend, he came back and he ran it. It took a few hours and it got a better answer than this team of uh, you know, four engineers got in a year. So that became the new method to uh, choose the size of all these transistors. Uh, so again, shows the power of automation. Uh, he was able to create something that is hugely more productive than having people do this by hand. 
Uh, you can't buy software to do exactly this. So if Altera had been able to buy software that solved this exact problem, they would have used it. It didn't exist. So what it took to make this procedure more efficient was somebody who understood the problem. So he understood um, how to size transistors, what you're trying to do in this circuitry, but he also understood software. So he could see how he could write a program that would just automate this and do it well for all eternity. So that's a very powerful combination. Uh, and you see that everywhere. I mean, if you think about companies like Uber and Expedia, a lot of the software companies that are disrupting industries uh, across society, they are taking things that were once done manually and basically automating them, making them more convenient, making them faster. And software is the, the language, the technique by which that's done. So you want to be good at it. Uh, so here's a quote. A great lathe operator commands several times the wage of an average lathe operator, but a great writer of software is worth 10,000 times the price of an average software writer. So any guesses who said this? Okay, so I mean, it wasn't me, okay? So I'm not quoting myself. It's not Dr. Rose. Okay, so I'm taking us off the table. Any guesses? There's somebody pretty famous. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know, do I have any spelling mistakes up there? Like what? <laughs> so, no, I believe I correctly spelt all the words and used them in context, so it was not Donald Trump. <laughs> so, uh, any other guesses? Okay, so think of somebody who's a famous software developer who, who got pretty good at it and made a lot of money. Bill Gates. So yeah, this is a quote from Bill Gates. Uh, and it's true. So, there's a, so that's Bill Gates' comment, and he's obviously hired many uh, hundreds and thousands of programmers over his career, so he knows what he's talking about. He's saying, this is a field where the best are not a little better than the average, they are hugely better than the average and they are therefore hugely valuable. Uh, you should find them, you should give them responsibility, you should pay them lots of money. There's a, an academic study that's old, it's from 1968, it's done by IBM, but its results have been proven again many times. They've redone this study many times and keep finding the same answer. So the best programmers are more than 10 times uh, better than the average. So uh, this study measured how long does it take uh, the best programmers to, to code, to actually write the program, how long to debug it, and then how well does the program work? Like how fast is the program when they're done? And they found the, the best versus the average took them 1 20th uh, as long to code it. You know, so that's a, that's a huge difference, right? So one person is spending a month to code something, the other person is spending about a day. 25 times faster at debugging it, uh, so getting it fully functional, and then the resulting program ran 10 times faster. So these are huge differences. You don't find this in most fields. You don't find it in carpentry or, or driving taxis. You know, the best taxi drivers don't get you to your destination 25 times faster than the next taxi driver. Well, you would pay that taxi driver a lot of money. You know, I'll take you an hour to get to the airport, but if you go with me, two minutes, right? No one can do that. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting about uh, skill in programming uh, is it's not something you're born with. So if you think, oh, I'm not a great programmer, I, I wish I was one of these superstars, uh, but I'm not, the best programmers are made, they're not born. So it comes down uh, partly to mindset, uh, but mostly to practice. If you practice more, you keep getting better at this. Okay, so this book, has anybody read this book, Outliers, by Malcolm Gladwell? Okay, so what does Malcolm Gladwell, so Gladwell says this, 10,000 hours to, to master. Uh, basically, he shows in a variety of fields, with software being one of his examples, he actually uses Bill Gates as an example, uh, that you need to spend a large amount of time practicing it to get really, really good. And Bill Gates not only hired you know, great programmers and believed it was important to hire great programmers, he, he was and is actually a great programmer by all accounts. Uh, but this book goes through why was Gates such a good programmer and how did that enable the early success of Microsoft. He had access to uh, mainframes at the University of Washington at a time when very few people did. So when he was in junior high and high school, he had almost unlimited time that he could program on the mainframes at the University of Washington. So he achieved this you know, 10,000 hours of practice far earlier in his life than almost anybody was able to do in programming at that time. So he was just much, much better at it because he had practiced at it so much. You know, he probably was, uh, had a mental outlook and so on that was well suited to programming as well, but the key thing was that he practiced. Uh, so, 
In summary, uh, software is key to designing complicated projects. It's and not just software products. So software is in everything because it's so much easier to develop software than hardware. So your anti-lock braking system in your car is mostly software. Computer chips that are evaluating the sensors saying whether or not your uh, wheels have locked up and deciding you know, what commands to send to the actuators of your brakes. It's done with a software system rather than just mechanical systems that try to do it all um, because it's so much easier to debug and refine software. So in all products today, you try to move complexity from the hardware, the mechanical parts, the electrical circuits, into software because it's so much more productive to get software working. Doesn't mean the mechanical part and the electrical parts are going away. You obviously need those. Um, but you're trying to, to move the complexity as much as you can into software. So engineers have to be able to uh, write software for these, these products. Uh, and even where you can't see the software in the end product, you know, you can't open up your car, you can open up your car and you can see the computer chips. But even where uh, those MRI machines, uh, where you look at a magnet and you say, I don't see a computer chip in the magnet, software was used to design that magnet. Uh, so all engineers use it to simulate, to refine their designs. And some of the software that you want isn't going to exist. So if you are a person who can actually write the custom software that you need, you're going to be a more productive design engineer. Uh, so the learning curve is long. Uh, that's where Gladwell talks about his 10,000 hours to master anything. So practice now. If you feel like, well, I'm not as good as this other person in my lab section, so maybe I'm not a good programmer. I mean, that's how I felt when my first year, in my first year programming course. I wasn't a very good programmer because I hadn't practiced very much. That changed when I got a job at a computer-aided design company uh, because now I was practicing every day for that summer and the next summer and for a while after I graduated. And that practice made me a good programmer. So it was that simple. If I practiced a lot, I became better. Uh, debugging is something that when you're starting you may find frustrating, but it is part of the learning. It's a key part of uh, being able to design software products. It's actually a key part of anything. When I'm interviewing, when I was at Altera and I was interviewing students uh, to, to bring on as full-time engineers, or today when I'm interviewing uh, to find new grad students, one of the questions I ask is what is your most difficult debugging problem that you've ever solved? Because I want to hear how that person you know, overcame adversity, something that was hard to figure out, how did he or she figure it out, whether it's software or something else. So while debugging may be frustrating when you're in the lab, uh, it is a really key skill. So think of that as a really important learning and throw yourself into it. Um, so with that, I'd like to end and uh, hopefully you will enjoy your experience practicing in APS 105. <clears throat> I haven't actually counted. Uh, so the question is, would I have 10,000 hours or not? So I haven't actually gone and counted. So now I'm kind of curious. Uh, I have spent a lot of hours programming. Uh, I don't know if it actually got to 10,000 or not. And I guess that is a, a somewhat random number that he came up with that makes it easy to write a book. Uh, so, but yeah, the principle I would take is you're gonna, the more time you spend practicing, the better you will be at it. So, uh, so throw yourself into it. But I'm going to go off and add that out and see how many hours it's been. So you need a feedback. I guess you're saying that basically don't well don't do a repetitive task for ten thousand hours. It has to be a task that's challenging you. So it has like to be one in which you that's interesting. I, yeah, I guess you, you need to be challenging yourself. I mean, so I'm I'm not sure. Reflection is part of it. For me, if you're actually solving different software problems, so as you get better, you challenge yourself with new problems, different uh, languages, different uh, applications, more larger things, you're kind of just fundamentally challenging yourself. Yes, if you basically said, well, I'm going to write uh, simple programs that do, thing, that do the following functions and I'm going to just keep tweaking them, okay? So different customers might want different tweaks and I'll just make small tweaks. 
and, and I, I've done a great job of automating it, so frankly, every tweak takes me several hours to do, but it's always relatively repetitive. Okay, you're not learning that much from that. So um, I think of this as like musical instruments. You know, a musical instrument, if you played the same song for 10,000 hours, you'd probably get really good at that song. Okay, and this, musical instruments are very much like this. I also play piano. I'm not progressing at the rate I'd like to because I don't practice enough. Uh, you need to try you know, different songs, gradually harder songs. Software is the same. You need to try different problems, gradually harder problems. Uh, so. <clears throat> well, thanks a lot, Tom. Yeah. Yeah.